million people can coalesce, wipe out unemployment once and for all, rebuild our union, strengthen it, and change the direction of America forever. I thank the Speaker and I thank the American people for this time. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks and insert extraneous materials into the record on the subject of this special order. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. The gentleman's Speaker. <clears throat> Pardon me. The gentleman's time has expired. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, now the chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to address you here on the floor of the House. And I would say, after listening to the presentation from my colleague from Illinois, it's been a little while since I've heard that. And I'm glad to hear the, the delivery you gave tonight. Um, a little more time here on the floor would be good for this whole Congress. And I appreciate the reference to our founding fathers and the years and the earlier foundation of our country, the principles that we agree on. And, and, and so I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I, and I came here to, to speak about some, um, some subject matter, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I think it's important that uh, you turn your ear to and that the members of this Congress turn their ear to and that the people in the United States do the same thing. Um, we have... We are in, in very dramatic times in the history of this country. And they encompassed a, a quite a continuum of a ride that we've been on. To, um, to go back and capture some of that, to frame the present moment that we're in, I take us back to a time, let's say back to a time in 1995. In 1995, shortly after Republicans won the majority for the first time in 40 years in this House of Representatives. And there was a real test that took place. There was a test that took place on the determination on the part of the, of the new majority after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, so to speak, that had determined that they wanted to bring this budget under control. They wanted to cut spending and put us on a path to balancing the budget. And that was initiated in 1995 with a real determination. And with also with the benefit of having a majority that work in cooperation with in the United States Senate. And um, that determination to balance the budget brought about a challenge from President Clinton and a number of vetoes on the part of President Clinton that brought about the shutdown in the federal government. And I remember those years. I was not in government at the time. I was full-time owner of the construction company that I formed in 1975 that continues to this day. And as I watched this in the news and I watched the debate on, on C-SPAN, I was inspired by the leaders that we had, the statesmen that we had, that, that stood and laid out the financial circumstances that we were in and the necessity to get federal government spending under control and the plan to bring forth a balanced budget. And while this government was shut down because of the vetoes of President Clinton, and my recollection is that it was be over a $300 billion proposed cut in Medicare that was the crux of this matter, where the whole issue pivoted on it. And a nation watched as there were threats that there were parts of the federal government that wouldn't provide, be providing services, and others were scared that they would lose theirs, that Social Security checks wouldn't be coming in on time, etc. The American public began to roil and boil and rise up and push back. And over a period of time, not I don't think at the fault of the members of the House of Representatives, but by the, by the circumstances of, the, of life and time, the public began to have a higher level of, of anxiety about what would happen if the federal government continued with the shutdown process that they were in. At a certain point, there was a request made for a unanimous consent agreement to go ahead and approve the funding in the Senate side. When that happened and the Senate passed a unanimous consent agreement, it washed over the House here, and um, the majority in the House was compelled to accept what had been delivered from the Senate on that day. It was a sad day for me as a businessman and a father and a person that was working to make my little part of the world as good as I could. I was disappointed that this Congress couldn't hold the line on spending, couldn't hold the line on this growth in government. And I believed that until I understood it from this perspective of standing here on the floor, Mr. Speaker, that the House had let us down. Today, I think it's a little bit different equation. I think they did as much as they could have done. And under the circumstances, because of the UC agreement in the Senate, the House didn't have much choice but to concede to the push that came from the Senate. But here's the point that I learned on that day, and I, take, I stand on it this day, Mr. Speaker, and that's this. 
There's not a dime that the federal government can spend that's not agreed to by the House of Representatives. We start the spending, we start the taxes, and if we say no, it won't be spent. Which means that if we hold our ground here, we can shut off the spending to anything that we choose to shut off. That's the way it's designed, designed to be by the founding fathers that were referenced by the gentleman from Illinois a little earlier. That's what the Constitution says, and it's, by the way, it's our obligation because we're the closest to the people. Every two years we're up for election or re-election, and if this House is going to change hands, it can change hands within a two-year period of time. It's a 24-24-7 campaign, meaning 24 months of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it goes on in perpetual campaign mode because we're always up for re-election. And that means that the House here is, is more responsive and more sensitive to the people than the Senate, which has a six-year election span of time. And if they, they can put up a contentious vote, one that runs against the will of their constituents in the first couple of years or three or four years of their term, and trust that the people might forget about it by the time they're up for re-election. Not so in the House. What we do here, people are not going to forget about, and they should not. I want us to be accountable all the time, and I want a public that has a long memory and one that's very astute and very well informed, informed and very well engaged. And we've been watching a populace that's been fitting that mold more and more. We've watched, Mr. Speaker, as um, the Tea Party groups across the country have brought themselves forward and filled up the town squares and filled up the town hall meetings and surrounded this Capitol, physically surrounded the United States Capitol, I believe for the first time in the history of America. We couldn't put a helicopter up there and take the picture because of air security concerns, but I walked around this building and I saw Americans here surrounding the Capitol, yes, holding hands, but not just a human chain around the Capitol, a human donut around the Capitol, six and eight people deep all the way around the Capitol, no thin spots in it, and thousands of people in the corners that weren't part of the human donut around this Capitol. They came here to say, keep your hands off of my health care. We reject Obamacare. We want no part of it. And this went on for days and days. People that wouldn't leave these Capitol grounds. And finally, on that sad day, last March, when Obamacare finally passed with all of the legislative shenanigans that enabled that to happen, and they were considerable and they were unprecedented, Mr. Speaker, when it finally passed, the people around here put up a groan, not necessarily of despair, an agony, because they'd seen American liberty ripped out by its roots and taken over our bodies nationalized by the federal government. Our health care, the federal government taking over our bodies, nationalizing our bodies and every, our skin and everything inside it, and putting a 10% tax on the outside if you go to the tanning salon. That's what happened with Obamacare, a nationalization of our, of our, the second most sovereign thing we have. The first most sovereign thing we have is our soul. The second most sovereign thing we have is our bodies, our skin, everything inside it, our health. And in the United States of America, we must have the right to manage our health to the maximum of our ability and not have the federal government diminish the options, take away the numbers of insurance policies we might buy, or diminish the health care providers that are out there and put this into a one-size-fits-all. That's what Obamacare did. And it's what it does if we let it continue to exist. But the circumstances of the government shutdown in 90, 1995 were within an economic environment that brought us to where we are today. And we should understand what that is, Mr. Speaker. We should know that during that, peri that, excuse me, during that period of time, there was a dot-com bubble. This was this unnatural growth in the economy that was brought about because we had learned how to store and transfer information faster and more efficiently and more effectively than ever before. And so there were millions of Americans that were investing in these dot-com companies that were involved in the technological era, in this modern dot-com dot era. And they were investing because we could store and transfer information more effectively than ever before. They were investing in our ability to store and transfer, but not adjusting it to the necessity that information and information transfer and manipulation ability helps our economy only to the extent that we can use it to provide a good or service more effectively than before, to produce 
efficiencies in our economy. And we found a lot of ways over those last um, 15, 16 years to produce more efficiencies because of the technology that's developed. But a lot of dot-com companies went under because they didn't have that, they didn't add that substance to add to the value of our overall economy. It isn't enough just to be able to store and transfer information better than ever before. You have to store and transfer it and help the efficiency so that companies could provide profitability. That was the only thing other than if you could market this information for recreational purposes. It's the other component, only two. And so this dot-com bubble grew out of an over-exuberance, an unnatural exuberance uh, that came from an optimism that we were going to take this economy someplace that had never been before. And that bubble was bound to burst. And I think it would have burst on its own. But there was a lawsuit filed against Microsoft, which lanced the bubble. The bubble, the dot-com bubble burst. And as it burst, any like a blister on your skin, it settles down into the hollow place underneath it. And there is a dip in the economy. And I believe that there was a concerted effort at that point to fill this hole created by the bursting of the dot-com bubble with low, unnaturally low interest rates and long-term mortgages that would allow people to build or buy houses that they otherwise couldn't have afforded, and it created a housing bubble. So if you think of a dot-com bubble that burst, that fell, it, when, it, when it collapsed, it went into a trough, Mr. Speaker, and that trough was sought to be filled by an unnatural bubble of the housing boom, which was created and a housing boom that was in the business of, that was in the process of unfolding and, and I say, stretching itself to its max while President Bush was elected in 2000 and the 2001 September 11th attacks came on our financial centers and this assault on America. So we saw that all came with this transition of the bursting of the dot-com bubble, the growth of the unnatural housing bubble, the assault on the United States in, on September 11th of 2001 on our financial centers and the attack on the American economy. And that was coupled with all of the spending we needed to do to go to war in Afghanistan, subsequently in Iraq. And all of that, in the, in the middle of all of that, we spent billions on, on standing up the Transportation Safety Administration, TSA, and all of the other security provisions that we put in place to make sure that America could be protected from more and more attacks from Al-Qaeda. All of this going against our economy. And within all of that, there was also the passage of No Child Left Behind, which took more money, and other components of the growth and the compassionate conservatism that was driven by the Bush administration, all of this while we're at war. Now, if I add this all up, it's not a very good formula for a balanced budget. And we had that balanced budget in the late 90s and rolling into the year 2000. And when I came here to this Congress, elected in 2002 and sworn in here in January 2003, and I came down here and said to the chairman of the budget committee, where's our balanced budget? He said to me, we can't balance the budget. It's not possible to balance the budget, and you'll not have a balanced budget to vote on. I went back to my office, Mr. Speaker, and I began to put together a budget that would balance and I, my green staff uh, was tasked with the job of putting together a budget that we could offer that would be balanced. We didn't get it completed. At that time, it was about a $2.7 trillion budget. And uh, to try to rewrite that in a balanced fashion as a freshman in Congress with a staff that's at that point not yet experienced was a very, very difficult task. And I got to the point where I wasn't as confident enough to offer it. And I wish now, looking back on it, that I would have offered a balanced budget. And I wish every year I would have offered a balanced budget. And what we would have seen happen would be the red ink that we have is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the American people have not been informed as how difficult it is to bring this budget to a balance. And so one of the important components of offering a budget that balances in this year, it tells us how big the problem is. And it's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I stood here and sat in this chamber and listened to the debate, engaged in it, listened to the 30-something group night after night after night that would come down here on the floor and make the argument that if we'd just put them in charge, if they would just have the gavels, they would fix this country. And so eventually, over time, Republicans lost the majority. Democrats won the majority in 2006. Nancy Pelosi came in as speaker. Now they had what they wanted. They were going to fix this country. 
And they did all right. They began to take that rather minor deficit and turn it into a huge deficit. And they began to make energy more expensive and take the prospects of success in America down instead of up. They were working on their vision of America, which is transfer payments, tax the rich, transfer those payments to other people that aren't as fortunate, or I'll just say not as productive. They may or may not be as, afford as fortunate. While this was going on, the deficit was growing, the dependency class was growing, and that was what was going on. There was a concerted effort to borrow money from the Chinese and transfer that money over into the pockets of a growing dependency class to create a bigger dependency class because that was the political base that was supporting the Democrats and still does in this Congress. And we watched this effort to expand the dependency class in America take place during the Pelosi Congress that began in 2007 through 2008. In 2008, Barack Obama was elected president, and now this Congress went on steroids because they had a president that would sign the legislation instead of veto the legislation that was sent out of this Congress. And what we saw happen was in an accelerated debt and more and more money borrowed from the Chinese and the Saudis and that 2.7 or 8 billion dollar budget raced on up an extra or trillion dollar budget excuse me raced on up another trillion dollars we've seen an additional 3 trillion dollars beyond our means that has been spent under this Obama administration supported by Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid the american people rose up mr speaker and they knew that it was irresponsible and they filled up the town hall meetings and they saw what was happening the summer of um, Several, I guess two or three summers ago, and the year might come to me and I can be confident enough to speak it into the record, but we had an energy crisis. We had gas at $4 a gallon, and I believe that was the summer of 2008. The gas was at $4 a gallon, and I went back and did town hall meetings that filled up with people, and they saw what was happening. And there was an effort in this Congress to shut down access to energy, a belief that if energy costs went up, people would use less. And we remember then the speaker, Nancy Pelosi, saying, I'm trying to save the planet. I'm trying to save the planet. Well, I think she believed that, that she was trying to save the planet. And what I saw happening was the actions were driving up the cost of energy. That $4 gas issue finally broke, and it started to spiral back downwards by the time of the election in 2008. But we had, in August of that year, a month-long energy debate taking place here on the floor. When we were ready to go home for that August, we had several special orders that were queued up for the end of business that day. Democrats offered a motion to shut the place down, which would have shut off the special orders about energy. Some of the members here decided, we're going to keep talking. And so we came one after another. And eventually the speaker shut the lights down, not completely off, shut the microphones off, shut the television cameras off and turned them sideways. And still we stood here for the month of August, all the way into Labor Day, every day making the case that we needed all energy all the time. Now that argument diminished when gas prices went back down again. It's before us again. And we must do an all-energy, all-the-time bill. I want to compliment Congressman Devin Nunes from California for all the work that he's done uh, on legislation that I believe he'll introduce tomorrow on all-energy, all-the-time. America needs to have cheap energy. We need to have cheap energy in, in a way that everything that we do costs energy. If you move anything, it takes energy. If you have any product, it takes energy to produce it, energy to deliver it, and energy to go pick it up and bring it home. And so the cost of energy is tied into the cost of everything that we have and do. And our America cannot be competitive with the rest of the world if we have high energy prices. And yet, that 2008 year drove energy prices up, $4 a gas. We saw the crude oil prices go way over $100 a barrel. And we're looking at that happening again. We've had the president move to shut down drilling offshore by executive order. We've seen Democrats in large numbers oppose opening up ANWR for drilling, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I've been for drilling up there for a long time. I've gone up there. There's a, we've drilled the North Slope in the early 70s, and if it did anything with the environment, it enhanced it. It didn't diminish it. 
And the strictest environmentalists we have couldn't fly over that country and point to a well and tell you how that it's even defaced the landscape or broken up the scenery. The wells are submersible. They don't show up. There are not roads to each of them. They go out on ice roads in the wintertime to service them. There's, it's a good place to go and develop oil on the North Slope, and we need to go get it. We need to drill offshore. We need to build, drill the Bakken region in North Dakota and Montana, and it spills over into Canada. And we need to continue to bring Canadian oil down into the United States and refine it here and be the best trading partner for the Canadians that they could possibly ask for. And if we fail to do so, they'll build a pipeline to the west and they'll pump that oil in the oil sands on out to tankers that will take that oil over to China, Japan, and places in Asia. They will do the logical thing. We need to make sure the logical thing is here in the United States. Mr. Speaker, that's just the energy issue. And as this, and this rolls forward, uh, the, the, another summer we had the issue of health care. And as the effort came to pass Obamacare here in the House of Representatives, the American people began to realize what was happening to their liberty. And they filled up the town hall meetings. We had town hall meetings in Iowa that got so big that they had to be moved outside because there wasn't room inside the biggest buildings, the biggest rooms we could find for all the people that came to, in a constitutional fashion, petition the government peacefully for redress of grievances. And they came and they were well informed and some of them had read the whole bill. And with great passion and sometimes with little tact and sometimes with great deference, they made the case to me over and over again. They didn't want Obamacare. They still don't want Obamacare. And when it was passed here in the House, they rejected it. And so I spent not quite a year of my life fighting the passage of Obamacare. And since that period of time, I've introduced legislation to repeal Obamacare immediately after its passage on that late night last March. We're coming up about 11 months, a little past 11 months since it's been passed into law. The American people still reject it. They want their liberty, they want their freedom, they want to manage their own bodies, manage their own health care, they want a free market system, they want a doctor-patient relationship. And they sent 87 new freshmen here to the House of Representatives to ensure that Obamacare would be repealed, that the funding to Obamacare would be shut off, and that we would see no more implementation or enforcement of Obamacare. And what has it brought us? these 87 new freshmen that stand together on that one square. Here's what it's brought us, Mr. Speaker. H.R. 2, presumably the second highest priority of the new Speaker of the House. It brought us a new Speaker of the House, Speaker John Boehner. And he sets the priorities, at least by tradition, for the first 10 bills that come out of the House, H.R. 1 through 10. And H.R. 2, the second highest priority, was the bill that repealed Obamacare. The legislation that I'd introduced in almost a year ago and teamed up with Michelle Bachman of Minnesota and others, including Connie Mack of Florida and um, Parker Griffith of Alabama, no longer in this Congress, a number of others that were part of this original effort to introduce legislation to repeal Obamacare and many others that signed on as co-sponsors and 178 that signed the discharge petition to repeal Obamacare, the message was very clear. And H.R. 2 was debated and passed the House of Representatives in the early stages here in the 112th Congress last month, excuse me, in January, where it was sent over to the United States Senate. That's an important step. Another important step is to do, as I've said since at least the middle of last summer, at every appropriations bill, introduce the language in that bill that cuts off all funding that would be used to implement or enforce Obamacare. That's an essential part of this and I'd gone back and read through the history of how this Congress shut down the funding for the Vietnam War and shut off a war that had gone on for over a decade and they did so by putting language in a continuing resolution that shut off the Vietnam War. And it was language that said in, um, in 1974, and they started some of this in 73, but in 74 that it said, notwithstanding any other provision of law, no, none of the funds in this continuing resolution for the Vietnam War, or for, for appropriations during the Vietnam War, none of the, notwithstanding any other provision of law, none of the funds in this act, and no funds heretofore appropriated 
shall be used to carry out offensive or defensive operations in the air over the seas adjacent to or the land of Vietnam or its adjacent countries. It's a bit of a paraphrase, but it makes the point succinctly, I believe, Mr. Speaker. When I read the debate on that appropriations bill and when I read the language of that, uh, of that notwithstanding language that was put into the continuing resolution that shut off the funds going to Vietnam to the point where bullets that were being unloaded on the dock at Da Nang presumably were loaded back up again. None of the funds could be used to carry out offensive or defensive operations. It cut off the supply support for South Vietnam's military. And we wondered why was it that they ran in the face of the North Vietnamese that spring in 1975? They had nothing left to fight with, Mr. Speaker. Their munitions were gone. They were played out. They didn't have heavy weapons. They didn't have light weapons that were well supplied. And it brought about the collapse of the South Vietnamese self-defense. And millions died in the aftermath, not just in Vietnam, in Cambodia and other places in Southeast Asia. I disagreed with the decision that this Congress made. But I do agree that the language in the continuing resolution was effective in shutting off the funding to the Vietnam War. And a similar language is the language that I've crafted to go into the appropriation bills from this point forward that says essentially notwithstanding any other provision of law, None of the funds in this act and no funds previously appropriated shall be used to carry out the provisions of Obamacare. That's the language that I sought to introduce and ask the Rules Committee to grant a waiver for, unsuccessfully I might add. That's the language that I ask be written into H.R. 1, the continuing resolution. It's a language that I tried to get offered here on the floor during H.R. 1 that was ruled out of order. And the amendments that I was able to get passed worked in compatibility with Denny Reberg of Montana and others. Denny Reberg, who did very, very good work on this, uh, on this appropriations bill on H.R. 1. And without his work, we might not have had anything that was in order. Because of his work, we had eight amendments that were in order that were voted on. Each of them cut off funding to Obamacare in some version or another. And I compliment all of my colleagues to work on that. But now we reach this point where we've got to draw a line. H.R. 1 took the hill. It said none of the funds in this bill is going to be used to implement Obamacare. No funds are going to go to fund Planned Parenthood. No funds are going to be used to fund abortion anywhere in the world out of this continuing resolution. But that language was not included in the continuing resolution that was passed night before last here in the House or if may perhaps it was last night, my nights blur together, that language was not included. We need better language than I'm suggesting here included in the next CR. This government shuts down March 18th if we don't now extend its funding again. I'd like to get a solution that takes us to the end of the fiscal year. But standing on the hill and defending the hill to shut off all funding to Obamacare since every Republican in the House and the Senate has voted to repeal Obamacare, everybody in the House has voted to cut off all funding to Obamacare at every opportunity, and that's eight of them. We have this opportunity now to write a new CR and to write the language into it that doesn't fund Obamacare, not just what's in the CR, but what is automatically appropriated. There are automatic appropriations, Mr. Speaker, that are in the Obamacare legislation, I will say deceptively written, that appropriate funds that go forward, whether or not this House acts, goes forward in perpetuity. Perpetuity, that means forever, if anybody out there is wondering what it is. And for a 10-year period of time, there are automatic appropriations of $105.5 billion over 10 years that automatically fund the implementation and enforcement of Obamacare if this House doesn't act to shut it off. Obamacare is implemented if we do nothing. Even if we pass the repeal, even if we don't authorize any new funding, $105.5 billion gets spent to implement it, which means that the roots of Obamacare go deep, and the deeper they go, the harder they are to rip out. And I've said it must be ripped out by the roots, Let's rip it out, Mr. Speaker, in this next CR. 
Let's retake the hill that we took with H.R. 1. Let's hold the hill. Let's stare the president down. Let's stare Harry Reid down. If we're not willing to do that, they will get everything that they're willing to fight for. This is the time for this new House with these new 87 Republican freshmen. They, every Republican that's voted to repeal and unfund Obamacare now needs to help us take the hill and hold the hill and stare the president down. Let's fund the government so it functions legitimately, but let's not cave into a president who may well shut down the entire United States government in order to preserve his pet project, Obamacare, which has been rejected by the American people and this Congress resoundingly. For that, Mr. Speaker, I would thank you for your attention and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Mr. Speaker, I move the House to now adjourn. Now, the question is on the motion to adjourn. Uh, those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Today, members passed an extension of the fiscal year 2011 spending for highway and mass transit programs. This extends funding through September 30th.